I am not Deborah Levy. Unfortunately, I would love to be Deborah Levy because all these books would be inside me. My name is John Freeman. It's my enormous pleasure to be introducing her tonight, and I'll be talking to her after she reads. For the past five years at dinner parties and with friends, there's been a moment when the conversation turns back to books at last. <laughs> and within that instant, an almost unbearably delicious opportunity has often emerged for me to ask whether my companions have ever read anything by Deborah Levy. When the answer has been no, I have briefly understood what it must be like to be God, or a very good doctor. Because in that exchange, if I make my case, here's essentially what I have the opportunity to do, to offer the listener more life. You have all already chosen more life, and you're in your seats, so you're going to get more life now, whether you want it or not. <laughs> but let me explain what I mean, should you decide you want even more life after we're done with you tonight. Opening a Deborah Levy book, one does not find our days and hours defined and ordered, lifted up and examined with tongs the way it so often is in a book, or especially in fiction. No. Now here is the full Monty of it, charged to the maximum voltage, violent, beautiful, strange, holy even. Levy's books are full of lovers with hateful longings. One rubs pepper all over the body of another. Lovers with desperate pleas for attention. One rides a pony into a dining room and feeds it cubes. Lovers with rivers of pasts inside them. Quote, as much as I try to make the past keep still and mind its manners, says one to another in Levy's gorgeous novel, Swimming Home, the first of three of her books to be nominated for the Booker Prize. Quote, it moves and murmurs with me through every day. What would happen if that past surfaced? That's the question so many of her books asks. And this is in part what makes Levy's work so brilliant, so reassuring, and so comforting. Because time and again, in her seven novels, three story collections, and two glorious memoirs, the past comes surging forth like water gushing through the most elegantly designed sandbags, our consciousnesses. Reading a book by Levy, one feels an enormous, genial, intelligent forgiveness bearing down upon you as a reader. She allows that we all live on the knife edge of such pressure Sometimes it's indeed our fault, or maybe it's just the culture's too. We can see us pushing back on this with the hesitation to say what it is we want sometimes. We can also see this pressure bearing down on us in our desperate attempts to get away from it all. It's not something Levy's characters can escape, though, this disquiet, this dis-ease, though they may try. Hey, Le Levy's novels are judging from her memoirs, her life too, are often set abroad, elsewhere, on brief getaways, or sometimes, in the case of hot milk, a kind of institution. Levy's gift as a writer has been essentially an extension of the theatrical, to put a group of people into a room and to create a whole new way of turning her ear to their pastnesses. Perhaps because that she, ha she has many inside of her. She was born in Johannesburg, moved to Wembley Park in 1968. She trained at Darlington College of Arts and began writing plays in 1981, ultimately acting as a writer and director of a theater in Cardiff. In the 1980s, she traded the play for the short story and began writing them. Her collections include Black Vodka. By the way, she has a genius for titles. Others include Amorous Discourse in the Suburbs of Hell, or Pillow Talk in Europe and other stories. <laughs> anyway, Black Vodka was up for the Frank O'Connor International Short Story Prize. And she's also won fellowships with the Lannan Foundation. And now she lives in London. She was, a 19, she was a 2018 fellow at the Columbia Institute for Ideas and Imagination based in Paris. Her latest books are the two autobiographies, Things I Didn't Want to Know, and the cost of living, these two swerving, warm, and achingly alive memoirs about growing up in South Africa, coming to England, writing, unbuilding a family, and to a large degree, unbuilding the illusions and delusions attached to her as a woman, and as a woman in a household. 
Imagine if Elena Ferranti wrote a memoir and you'll get a whiff of how these books leap you out of your seat. And she's about to read from them as well as her new novel, The Man Who Saw Everything. And you'll see, you'll find yourself standing. Ladies and gentlemen, Deborah Levy. Good evening, and thank you very much, John. Um, the experience of listening to his introduction jet-lagged in the dark <laughs> with the ground sort of moving here in Santa Fe is something I'll never forget. <laughs> thank you for coming out tonight, and my big gratitude to the Lannan family and the foundation for bringing me out here. Um, it's odd what you collect in, uh, on a book tour. Uh, what I mean is, someone said to me, that's an apricot tree, and in summer, all the apricots fall on the curb. And I thought, that's what I'll think about, the apricot tree here in Santa Fe. So I'm going to start uh, by reading three poems from a poetry collection I wrote 20 years ago called An Amorous Discourse in the Suburbs of Hell. I cut my writerly teeth on poetry. And in those days, I wrote on a typewriter. And we used to take our pages of A4 with our poems on it to pubs in London. Our hands shook. People drank beer. And trembling, we, uh, you know, age 18, 19, we read our work. And um, the idea for an amorous discourse really came from the poet William Blake, who, age nine, was walking um, across a stretch of green in London called Peckham Rye, and he saw eight angels. Uh, sitting in a tree. And he came home and he said to his dad, I saw, uh, I saw angels sitting, sitting in the boughs of a tree today. And his father said, don't tell lies, William. So I thought, what would happen if a female angel washed up on the shores of Britain and she met an accountant in the suburbs? And they kind of had an argument. Um, I, I, I'm into arguments. In, in, in uh, The Man Who Saw Everything, my latest book, my leading man, Saul Adler, and Jennifer Moreau argue for 30 years. Why argue for three minutes when you could argue for 30 years? And some of... Um, some of the tone for the man who saw everything is really laid down in, in this collection. So I'm just going to read a few. He, there you are, all wonderful and winged and leaking that smile. Come in. I want to walk through snowstorms burning for you, peeling oranges for you, shimmering and shivering, my assured modern woman. Who are you, anyway? She, I have come to save you from the suburbs of hell, to rub my skin against the, regula against the regularity of your habits, to bend your thoughts like a spoon, to find your memories lost in software, dived like a thought out of paradise, into your acrylic arms. He, uninvited, you flew into my house and ate all my plums. <laughs> I woke up to your starry tattoos, fingers tangled in your hair. I asked you to stay. Now you make incense from my heart and liver, spit mean small feathers at my good intentions. No wonder you fell from grace into my poor lap. Fearful pigeons scurry about the roof 
ever since you arrived. She. Ever since I arrived on your blue planet, most of it ocean, I hear the breath of an octopus bigger than a car, eggs in her arms calling for you. Ever since I arrived, I hear the historic echo of yesterday's lambs under the tarmac of the ring road, barring and frolicking for you. Ever since I arrived, you walk from the table to the window ledge, cursing the pigeons on your roof, their ragged wings, and my ragged wings opening for you. And so it goes on. So I'm going to read just a, a, a short extract from my two memoirs. Um, <clears throat> in Britain, these are called living autobiographies. And the reason I called them that is that my understanding of autobiography is that they're written at the end of a life uh, with hindsight, uh, with, with some wisdom. And I thought, well, how about writing in the storm of life? when you're not really wise, stuff's happening. Um, and I'm going to call it a living autobiography. Uh, in America, I think it's called a working, uh, a working autobiography. Um, and I wanted to document uh, my 40s and then my 50s, because they seem to be pretty, um, not really recorded, uh, female experience at that age. So things I don't want to know is number one, and no one can say the title. Um, and the things we don't want to know are the things we know anyway, but kind of push down and repress. You know, so if we say, um, think, uh, you know what, that, that person, I always feel a bit frightened when uh, he speaks to me. Um, so there's something we know about that person, but we, we kind of push it down, right? So the things we don't want to know are the things we know anyway. Um, and I start with the narrator, who is quite a lot like myself. Um, in spring, and I, I'll, I'll just, I won't say too much, I'm just going to, I'm just going to go for it. That spring, when life was very hard and I was at war with my lot and simply couldn't see where there was to get to, I seemed to cry most on escalators at train stations. Going down them was fine, but there was something about standing still and being carried upwards that did it. From apparently nowhere, tears poured out of me and by the time I got to the top and felt the wind rushing in, it took all my effort to stop myself from sobbing. It was as if the momentum of the escalator carrying me forwards and upwards was a physical expression of a conversation I was having with myself. Escalators, which in the early days of their invention were known as traveling staircases or magic stairways, had mysteriously become danger zones. I knew things had to change when one week I found myself staring intently at a poster in my bathroom titled The Skeletal System. This featured a human skeleton with its inner organs and bones labeled in Latin and which I constantly misread as the societal system. <laughs> I made a decision. If escalators had become machines with torrid emotionality, a system that transported me to places I did not want to go, why not book a flight to somewhere I did want to go. Three days later, I zipped up my brand new laptop and found myself sitting in aisle seat 22C, heading for Palma, Mallorca. 
As the plane took off, I realized that being stranded between the earth and the sky was a bit like being on an escalator. <laughs> the man unlucky enough to be sitting next to a weeping woman <laughs> looked like he'd once been in the army and now spent his days lying on a beach. I was so pleased my cheap airline buddy was a tough guy with hard square shoulders and jagged welts of sunburn striping his thick neck because I did not want anyone to attempt to comfort me. <laughs> if anything, my tears seemed to send him into a tantric shopping coma. <laughs> he called for the air hostess and ordered two cans of beer, a vodka and coke, an extra coke, a tube of Pringles, a scratch card, a teddy bear stuffed with mini chocolate bars, a Swiss watch on special offer, and asked the crew if the airline had one of those questionnaires to fill in where you get a free holiday if it's drawn out of the hat. The tanned military man pushed the teddy bear into my face and said, that'll cheer you up if nothing will, as if the bear was a handkerchief with glass eyes sewn on it. <laughs> so, uh, I'm skipping now to uh, about 33 pages, and uh, I am in a, a small hotel in, in Mallorca, run by this incredible woman called Maria, who irrigates her orchard. She's built an irrigation system herself, and this waters the oranges and lemons, and, um, and uh, the narrator, who is a, quite a lot like myself, I, I say this because when you write um, something memoirish, or even have the cheek to call it a living autobiography, you have to kind of find out who this I is. You have to find this first person voice is. And, um, and that's what, uh, that's what this book's about, really. So, the narrator goes to a little shop in the village, and she wants to buy a bar of very high cocoa content chocolate for Maria, the landlady of the pensione. The owner of the grocery stall was a distinguished Chinese man originally from Shanghai. For as long as I'd known him, he was always reading books behind the counter, tortoise uh, shell spectacles perched halfway down his nose. His black hair was now streaked with silver as we exchanged superficial greetings. How are you? Yes, not many tourists at this time of year. Yes, it is cold. The forecast said it might even snow. How was I going to spend my day? I told him I was about to walk to the next village to see the monastery where Georges Saint and Frédéric Chopin stayed during the winter of 1838. He smiled, but it was more of a grimace. Oh, yes, Georges Saint. The Mallorcans didn't like her. She dressed in men's clothing, and she said Mallorcans preferred their pigs to their people. No. George Saint was not a woman he would like to share a bottle of wine with. When I laughed, I was not really sure what I was laughing about or whom I was laughing at. George Saint smoked large cigars to get through her day. She would have needed them living in the gloomy monastery of Jesus the Nazare with its withered flowers and suffering wooden saints lurking in the alcoves, it seemed a sinister place to live with children and to have a love affair. The guidebook told me that she had no choice but to rent rooms here because no one dared offer accommodation to Chopin, who'd been uh, diagnosed with tuberculosis. I admired her for trying to keep cheerful for her children 
and writing at her desk wearing Chopin's trousers instead of wasting her life weeping about her circumstances. With this in mind, I briskly walked out of the monastery and made my way through the almond trees towards the silver sea, fierce and roaring beyond the cliffs. As the waves crashed on the rocks and the wind numbed my fingers, I waited for something to happen. I think I was waiting for a revelation, something big and profound that would shake me to the core. Nothing happened. Nothing happened at all. And then what came to mind was the poster in my bathroom called the skeletal system. <laughs> the second thing that came to mind was the mute piano in the hotel, a piano that was polished every day but never played. I don't know why it preoccupied me, but it had caught my attention. In fact, I tried not to look at it on my way down the stairs that morning. I thought about all the things I had hoped for, and I laughed. The sound of my own cruel laughter made me want to die. So what, what, what's um, being thought about there are a whole number of things. Um, and one of those things is that I had written a book called Swimming Home, and John alluded to it, and it had been turned down by a big handful of British publishers. And I kind of felt that my voice had been shut down like that piano with, it, with it, you know, the lid shut down. It was Maria polished it every day. Um, I just didn't know how to, how to get my writing into the world. Um, and that was one of the things that I was thinking about on those escalators in, in London. I realized that the question I'd asked myself while writing this book, Swimming Home, was, as surgeons say, very close to the bone. What do we do with knowledge that we cannot bear to live with? What do we do with the things we do not want to know? And it ends with the uh, Chinese shopkeeper. I had told him that to become a writer, I had to learn to interrupt, to speak up, to speak a little louder, and then louder, and then to just speak in my own voice, which is not loud at all. I rearranged the chair and sat at the desk in my hotel room, and then I looked at the walls to check out the PowerPoints so I could plug in my laptop. The hole in the wall nearest to the desk was placed above the basin, a precarious socket for a gentleman's electric razor. That spring in Mallorca, when life was very hard and I simply could not see where there was to get to, it occurred to me that where I had to get to was that socket. Even more useful to a writer than a room of her own is an extension lead and a variety of adapters <laughs> for Europe, America, Asia, and Africa. <laughs> Thank you very much. So, so that's part one, and um, that's translated into 15 languages now. So things I don't want to know, you can imagine um, that sometimes it's a title that I no longer recognize. Um, it, 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 the, the, the wonderful thing about translation is that it's almost as if the, um, sometimes the book has been reimagined, um, which excites me uh, hugely. Part two is titled The Cost of Living. And um, that was written uh, in my 50s, I'm now 60, 
Uh, and I'm just going to read two pages from it. <coughs> Part three, which I'm writing now, um, so I've got 40s, 50s, and a little bit of, of 60. That's a cheat, really, isn't it? It's not really going to be 60s. It's going to be kind of 60, 61. Uh, that's called real estate. And I'm writing it now, and I'm writing some of it in Santa Fe now. And that's about, uh, quite literally, uh, what women own. Uh, so, yeah, property portfolio. Uh, but uh, what we claim and what we discard and, and what we bequeath. And I think that apricot tree here in Santa Fe will be in that book, Real Estate. As Orson Welles told us, if we want a happy ending, it depends on where we stop the story. One January night, I was eating coconut rice and fish in a bar on Colombia's Caribbean coast. A tan, tattooed American man sat at the table next to me. He was in his late 40s, big muscled arms, his silver hair pinned into a bun. He was talking to a young English woman, perhaps 19 years old, who'd been sitting on her own reading a book. But after some ambivalence, had taken up his invitation to join him. At first, he did all the talking. After a while, she interrupted him. Her conversation was interesting, intense, and strange. She was telling him about scuba diving in Mexico, how she'd been underwater for 20 minutes and then surfaced to find there was a storm. The sea had become a whirlpool and she had been anxious about making it back to the boat. Although her story was about surfacing from a dive to discover the weather had changed, it was also about some sort of undisclosed hurt. She gave him a few clues about that. There was someone on the boat who she thought should have come to save her. And then she glanced at him to check if he knew that she was talking about the storm in a disguised way. He was not that interested and managed to move his knees in a way that jolted the table so that her book fell to the floor. He said, you talk a lot, don't you? <laughs> she thought about this, her fingers combing out the ends of her hair while she watched two teenage boys selling football shirts to the tourists in the cobbled square. It was not that easy to convey to him, a man much older than she was, that the world was her world too. He had taken a risk when he invited her to join him at his table. After all, she came with a whole life and libido of her own. It had not occurred to him that she might not consider herself to be the minor character and he the major character. <laughs> In this sense, she had unsettled a boundary collapsed a social hierarchy, broken with the usual rituals. While the waitress collected plates heaped with crab claws and fish bones, I was reminded of the Oscar Wilde quote, be yourself, everyone else is already taken. <laughs> that was not quite true for her. She had to make a bid for herself that possessed freedoms that he took for granted. After all, he had no trouble being himself. You talk a lot, don't you? To speak our life as we feel it is a freedom we mostly choose not to take. But it seemed to me that the words she wanted to say were lively inside her, mysterious to herself as much as anyone else. Later, when I was writing on my hotel balcony, I thought about how she had invited 
the drifting man to read between the lines of her undisclosed story. She could have stopped the story by describing the wonder of all she'd seen in the deep, calm sea before the storm. That would have been a happy ending, but she did not stop there. She was asking him and herself a question. Do you think I was abandoned by that person on the boat? If he was the wrong reader for her story, I thought on balance she might be the right reader for mine. And here's the thing that I couldn't put into this book, is that uh, when her book uh, fell to the floor, I was leaving this restaurant and I bent down to pick it up for her, and it was my novel Swimming Home. <laughs> I quickly put it back down on the table and, and got out of there. Um, but I thought it was a sort of gift. Um, I, I couldn't put it in my book because it, it felt like I was just giving a big puff for my novel, right? Um, but there you go. That's, that's, that's what happened. And here's how I use this idea of, of this, the metaphor of, of the storm for life. Um, this chapter is called The Tempest. Everything was calm. The sun was shining. I was swimming in the deep. And then when I surfaced 20 years later, I discovered there was a storm, a whirlwind, a bl blasting gale lifting the waves over my head. At first, I wasn't sure I'd make it back to the boat. And then I realized... I didn't want to make it back to the boat. Chaos is supposed to be what we most fear, but I have come to believe it might be what we most want. If we don't believe in the future we are planning, the house we are mortgaged to, the person who sleeps by our side, it is possible that a tempest long lurking in the clouds might bring us closer to how we want to be in the world. Life falls apart. We try to get a grip and hold it together. And then we realize we don't want to hold it together. When I was around 50, and my life was supposed to be slowing down and becoming more stable and predictable, life became faster, unstable, unpredictable. My marriage was the boat, and I knew that if I swam back to it, I would drown. It is also the ghost that will always haunt my life. I will never stop grieving for my long-held wish for enduring love that does not reduce its major players to something less than they are. I am not sure I have often witnessed love that achieves all these things, so perhaps this ideal is fated to be a phantom. What sort of questions does this phantom ask of me? It asks political questions for sure, but it is not a politician. When I was traveling in Brazil, I saw a brightly colored caterpillar as thick as my thumb. It looked as if it had been designed by Mondrian its body marked with symmetrical squares of blue, red, and yellow. I couldn't believe my eyes. Most peculiar of all, it appeared to have two vibrant red heads, one on either side of its body. I stared at it over and over again to check if this could possibly be true. It was possible, as I discovered later, because the caterpillar presented a false head to protect itself from predators. At this time, I could not decide which part of the bed I wished to sleep on. Let's say the pillow on my bed faced south. Sometimes I slept there. And then I changed the pillow so it faced north and slept there too. In the end, I placed a pillow on each side of the bed. Perhaps this was a physical expression of being a divided self, 
of not thinking straight, of being in two minds about something. When love starts to crack, the night comes in. It goes on and on. It is full of angry thoughts and accusations. These tormenting internal monologues don't stop when the sun rises. That is what I resented most, that my mind had been abducted and was full of him. It was nothing less than an occupation. My own unhappiness was starting to become a habit in the way that Beckett describes sorrow becoming a thing you can keep adding to all your life, like a stamp or an egg collection. <laughs> I've written quite a lot about mothers and daughters, I've discovered. Um, and I'm going to wind up with, um, with the way the maternal can be written about in an autobiography and then kind of flip it uh, uh, for a novel. And uh, this novel is called Hot Milk. So I'm still reading from The Cost of Living, but some of The Cost of Living is going to... Um, find its way into hot milk and vice versa. When um, my story collection, Black Vodka, started to get translated in Europe, my publishers all took me out to vodka bars. <laughs> and then I went and wrote a book called Hot Milk. <laughs> Night Wandering. My mother taught me how to swim, and she taught me how to row a boat. She was born in South Africa, grew up in the windy city of Port Elizabeth, and longed for the sea every day in the four decades she lived in North London. In old age, my mother had found a swimming technique to totally give herself to the water. This involved floating on her back, Emptying her thoughts, she said, and surrendering to the flow. She showed me a trick in the murky swimming ponds on Hampstead Heath, London, floating Ophelia style with the ducks and weeds and leaves. I still try to do her trick, but I can only float for 10 seconds before I start to sink. Likewise, when I turn my mind to my mother's death, I can only do so for 10 seconds before I start to sink. There is a photograph I have kept of my mother in her late 20s. She is sitting on a rock at a picnic with friends. Her hair is wet because she's just had a swim. There is a kind of introspection in her expression that I now relate to the very best of her. I can see that she is close to herself at this random moment. I'm not sure that I thought introspection was the best of her when I was a child and teenager. What do we need dreamy mothers for? We do not want mothers who gaze beyond us, longing to be elsewhere. We need her to be of this world Lively, capable, entirely present to our needs. Did I mock the dreamer in my mother and then insult her for having no dreams? As the vintage story goes, it is the father who is the hero and the dreamer. He detaches himself from the pitiful needs of his women and children and strides out into the world to do his thing. He is expected to be himself. When he returns to the home that our mothers have made for us, he is either welcomed back into the fold or becomes a stranger who will eventually need us more than we need him. He tells us some of what he has seen in his world and we give him an edited version of the living we do every day. Our mothers live with us in this living, and we blame her for everything because she is nearby. At the same time, 
we try not to collude with myths about her character and purpose in life. All the same, we need her to feel anxiety on our behalf. After all, our everyday living is full of anxiety. If we do not disclose our feelings to her, we mysteriously expect her to understand them anyway. And if she moves beyond us, comes close to being a self that is not at our service, she has transgressed from being the mythic primal task, from the mythic primal task of being our protector and nurturer. Yet, if she comes too close, she suffocates us, infecting our fragile courage with her contagious anxiety. If our mother does the things she needs to do in the world, we feel she has abandoned us. It is a miracle she survives our mixed messages written in society's most poisoned ink. It is enough to drive her mad. And I quote uh, the French writer Marguerite Durat from her book Practicalities. I believe that always, or almost always, in all our childhoods and in all the lives that follow them, the mother represents madness. Our mothers always remain the strangest, craziest people we've ever met. <laughs> So then, uh, on to hot milk. Um, a mother and daughter uh, go to the south of Spain, Almeria, um, on a kind of pilgrimage because this is a book that explores hypochondria. So we either are one or we know someone who is. Um, I mean, who would really write a novel about hypochondria, right? But I thought I'd give it a go. Because I was interested in how uh, the body speaks for us, how symptoms can say the things that are too awkward, um, too uncomfortable for us to really put into words. And so when I was researching hot milk, I spoke to uh, lots of uh, clinicians and doctors and psychoanalysts, and uh, um, doctors told me that um, they called that, uh, so, so if you go to the doctor and you say, um, you know, I, I've got a headache, and, and the doctor says, well, when did it start? And you say, Thursday, the doctor's making notes. He's taking a narrative, it's called taking a narrative. But the hypochondriac has so many mysterious symptoms. It's as if he or she doesn't actually want to be diagnosed. Wants to, doesn't want to pin, be pinned down in a narrative. So the psychoanalyst Jacques Lacan said, uh, the hypochondriac is asking a question he or she doesn't want answered. I don't know if that's true. But the mother's the hypochondriac in my story, and the, the daughter, Sophia, is 25. And she has been kept by her mother's side for much too long in life. Um, and uh, she's sort of like a girl detective, always trying to sleuth her mother's symptoms. What's wrong with my mother today? And right at the end of the book, Sophia, who's become much bolder in her life, has this to say about her mother. I had been waiting on her all my life. I was the waitress, waiting on her and waiting for her. What was I waiting for? Waiting for her to step into herself or step out of her invalid self? Waiting for her to take the voyage out of her gloom, to buy a ticket to a vital life with an extra ticket for me? Yes. I had been waiting all my life for her to reserve a seat for me. 
The door to the concrete terrace on the beach opened of its own accord. A breeze filled the room, a warm desert breeze coming in, deep salt smell of seaweed and hot sand. The waves were crashing on the beach and on the table on the terrace, her laptop resting on it. The night stars of her screensaver, made in China, open under the real night stars in Spain. And this is what Sophia says. All summer, I had been moonwalking in the digital Milky Way. It's calm there, inside my laptop. But I'm not calm. My mind is like the edge of motorways where foxes eat the owls at night. In the star fields, with their faintly glowing paths running across the screen, I have been making footprints in the dust and glitter of the virtual universe. It never occurred to me that like the Medusa, technology stares back and that its gaze might have petrified me, made me fearful to come down, down to earth, where all the hard stuff happens, down to the checkout tills and the barcodes and the too many words for profit and the not enough words for pain. And what did she imagine for herself and for her mother? I imagine that my mother is wearing smart shoes with straps over her ankles. She is pointing to her watch, inviting me to walk faster <coughs> so we will not be late for the cinema. She has booked the tickets. Yes, she has chosen our seats. Walk faster, Sophia, faster. She points to her watch. I don't want you to miss the trailers. <laughs> Thank you. Um, not very much more reading now. Um, so, just one small paragraph from my new book, The Man Who Saw Everything, which I will be discussing with John. So this is written in the first person um, from a male point of view. And the man is Saul Adler. The book starts when he's 28 and he's trying to cross the Abbey Road in London. And that's the iconic uh, zebra crossing. Do you say zebra? Yeah, zebra crossing um, that, that was made so famous on the Beatles uh, al album, Abbey Road. And while I was researching the book, I used to sit on the wall outside uh, the studio, EMI studio, where Abbey Road was recorded and watch tourists from all over the world uh, walk across this, this, the zebra. And it, was, it really was so cool and, and such a joyful thing to do because I could see that they were acting out a piece of history. So they decide whether they were John or Paul or Ringo. <laughs> and um, and uh, it, was very, it was very playful. And somehow um, dangerous, too, because they could get run over. <laughs> so I researched how the original photograph was taken by Ian Macmillan in 1969. And he only had 10 minutes to take the photograph of the fabulous four uh, crossing that zebra crossing. Um, he, they paid a policeman. Uh, to stop the traffic for 10 minutes. And Ian Macmillan um, climbed up a step ladder and, and took that photograph. And so I have Saul Adler's girlfriend, Jennifer Moreau, uh, bring a ladder with her to the Abbey Road to take a photograph of Saul crossing, crossing that um, zebra crossing for various reasons. I'm just going to read the first paragraph because it's an argument that goes on for 30 years. 
it's not unlike the angel and the accountant I discovered when I was thinking about all of this on the 11-hour flight here. (laughs) It's like this, saw Adler. When I was 23, I loved the way you touched me, but when the afternoon slipped in, you were already looking for someone else. No, it's like this, Jennifer Moreau. I loved you every night and every day, but you were scared of my love, and I was scared of my love too. No, she said, I was scared of your envy, which was bigger than your love. Attention, Saul Adler, attention. Look to the left and to the right, cross the road, and get to the other side. Thank you.